be with you. If you are able, please stand for the gospel. This morning's gospel lesson is written in the first chapter of the gospel according to St. Mark, beginning with the 29th verse. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone's looking for you. And Jesus replied, Let's go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Here ends our gospel lesson. Please bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Father God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our salvation. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Spirit of God, fall fresh in us today. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So today's gospel lesson brought back some memories for me of a bus tour that Danny and she can't, I'm sorry, she brings her greetings to you this morning. Our grand dog is sick in Kelowna and she has to look after him. And, but she, my, and my son John and I, um, we took a trip nearly two decades ago. We went uh, with Trafalgar, and it was called, you know, the Trafalgar Tours. It starts and finishes in London. We did one that was called the European World. We went as far south as Rome, and then back up uh, to London. And there were about 60 people on this tour, and they came from around the world. I mean, we had Aussies, Kiwis, those are people from uh, New Zealand, you know, there were some people from South America. There was some people, there was actually a couple from Barbados. There were some Yanks. And then, of course, we were the three Canucks that were on the trip. And, you know, it was really wonderful. Over the, it was almost three weeks, and over that time, we got to know each other. And, you know, it was interesting. After a very short period of time, the fact that I was a pastor came out. We were in Rome, and we were in front of, I was talking to this about Rick, this, the, telling this of Rick this morning. So if you go to St. Paul's Church, it's outside the old uh, boundaries of Rome. And when you walk into that church, there's a huge statue, maybe 20 feet tall, of this man in a cloak, and, and he's got a hood on. And, and he's looking down and he's got a sword like this that's in the ground and people from the tour, you know, they're milling around there and they go, what in the world does that mean? So I said, I think I can shed, shed some light and I said, that's the Apostle Paul. He was crucified here in Rome and I said, so this, this statue is saying here he came to the end of the journey and what was it that was the most precious to him in that journey but the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God? Oh. How did you know that? <laughs> I said, well, I'm a pastor. Well, now I was outed. And there was one guy, I told Rick, this Australian guy. And when we went in the church, he goes, there's a pope in it. Why don't you go up there and tell us, see what we got? Just chuckle. Every church, there was this guy, Robert. There's a pulpit, Ed. Let's see what you got. Knowing I couldn't get up there. But he kept ribbing me. 
good-natured Ribby, but he kept really neat. Then one day we were kind of getting near the end of the trip, and it was one of those, you know, on a bus tour, you have to go between cities, and so it was an afternoon, it was in the summer, it was kind of hot, and, you know, most people were napping. Yeah. including Denny was napping. And then over here, the seat over here, right, was empty. And so all of a sudden, I kind of see in my periphery this Robert, who's this huge Australian guy. He's kind of precariously coming down, you know, the bus uh, aisle, and he sits down, plops down right beside me. He says, Ed, I go, yeah. He said, you being a pastor and all, I have some questions for you. Would you be willing to hear my story? And I said, sure. So, and you know, it was kind of, it was, he felt like he could, he could speak. And so he said, I want to tell you about my mother. My mother, she, you know, he tells me that she was a, very, very staunch Roman Catholic woman who deeply, deeply, deeply believed. She went to Mass every day. She was a part of the church. She was, you know, she was constantly at the church, knew the priest really well. I mean, she, her boys, her two boys, she grew, they grew up in the church. They were baptized. They were confirmed. But, you know, as adults, they just never darkened the door of that church. And the summer before, so this was the summer of 2005, summer of 2004, she got very, very sick. And the family, you know, they were thinking, doctors will pull her through this, it's all going to be okay. But it turns out that she just got worse and worse, despite their interventions, their tests, everything else. She slipped into a coma. The doctors, the prognosis was that every day that passed, her chances of recovery went from slim to none. And one day, they call, you know, uh, them in and they say, you better get your mom's stuff in order. <clears throat> and then a couple of days later, they call him in again and say, Mom's not going to make it through the night. So here we have this big, strong, strapping Australian guy who just loses it. He just sobs and sobs and sobs. And then, you know, it was interesting. At that time, he remembered from his youth how his mother would go to church and pray every day, every day. So he resolves, I'm going to the hospital chapel. He gets to the chapel, and there's a, a rail in the front, just like here. He grabs the rail, he kneels down, and then he prays to God. God, you know me, you know my mom, you know I love her, you know I'd do anything for her. If you heal her, I will go to Mass every Sunday. Gets up. Walks out. She made it through the night. And she made it through the next day. And the next day. And the next day. She go out of the coma. Regains her strength. Within a couple of weeks, she's back home living on her own. Just like Peter's mother-in-law. Not as quickly, but just like Peter's mother-in-law. Fever. It, it's a terrible thing. It's debilitating. I mean, who knows what the cause of the fever was. But Jesus healed her. So then I knew what was coming. As the weeks went on, I mean, he went to church, he went to Mass, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And then when he left the trip, you know, they left for the trip, and he said, 
every Sunday it got harder to come back. He says, I am sure you're not boring. But he said, it's so boring. It's so repetitive. I don't know if I can do it. What if I stop? let me stop that really happened that was really a request that really happened so there you are on a bus in Europe with a guy who has suddenly come clean to you it's real, a real question for him. I just can't do it. So you sit there and you start to theologize first. Well, you could, I could come back with a technical response. Technically, it's a vow. You make a promise to God based on God's performance. God performs something, then I make an offering. It was classic. Robert says, heal my mom, and then I'll go to Mass. God held up his part of the God bargain, right? So now it's up to you. You have to live up to yours. But it's interesting. If you look at the Old Testament, you look at a chapter in Leviticus. Leviticus 27 actually is a whole chapter on how you can get out of vows. <laughs> Serious. Serious. There is a whole chapter in which you can buy your way out of a vow. So I thought to myself, this is not going to be helpful for him. What he vowed was not in Leviticus 27. In Leviticus 27, you'd go make an offering. It was all legal. You make an offering. Get out of the vow. But where would he take it? And who would he give it to? Isn't it interesting how when you think about theology, when it comes to real life, it's all out the window. Then I thought about Jesus. And Jesus in Matthew, he rebukes people. He says, don't you make a vow. You've, whole, you've heard it in the old days. Make a vow and live up to your vow. And then Jesus said, don't do that. Because if you make a vow and you and, and you, you talk to you, you make the vow in God's name, remember, the heaven is God's, the earth is God's, the temple in Jerusalem is the, the house uh, in the city in Jerusalem is the great city of a great king. How dare you make these kinds of vows? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. So was Jesus telling me now to berate this guy? Why'd you make the vow? That was pretty silly. That wouldn't help. And then you could act in Acts. Paul made a vow. Read Acts 18.18. 18. He made a vow to be a Nazarite. And when, it, when that time is over, he goes to the temple, he makes an offering, he shaves his head. He did that. So I'd say, between Jesus and Paul, you're in a bad place. And, but how does that help him? How does that help him? So I said to him, Robert, do you believe God knows everything? He said, yes. He said, God does know everything. He knows everything about you. Do you think that God would know that you're going to have trouble with this vow that you made? <coughs> Do you think that God knew that we'd be sitting on the bus together and you'd be asking me this question? If God knows everything. He said, yeah. Yeah, I think God would know. 
He said to him, knowing all that, God healed your mother. You know, Robert, he is no different than the people in today's gospel lesson. What's interesting is that Peter's mother-in-law had been healed in front of them, their eyes at twilight, and this is important because it's a Sabbath and it's over at twilight. And so when it was over, people could bring, they wouldn't be breaking the Sabbath laws and bringing their, their loved ones to Jesus. And so at night, they, they, you've got this whole village in front of the door. And, and Jesus is healing all of these people. You know, what's wonderful about this is that the, with these healings and these exorcisms, what's really happening there is that the kingdom of God is breaking through. Because remember, Jesus, he said at the beginning of this chapter, Jesus says, repent and turn to God, for the kingdom of God is near you. And whenever Jesus is near, there is the kingdom of God. And when he heals, it shows what? That the kingdom of God is present. That the kingdom of God and Jesus being the representative of the kingdom of God there has authority over disease, has authority over demons. And they have no, they have, they, they have no choice. No choice in front of Jesus. When Jesus said, be healed, the disease had to leave the person. When he said to a demon, you're out, the demon had no choice but to leave that person. It was an inbreaking of the, of the kingdom of God. It was the Son of God come to show him he's the, them he's the Messiah. And you know what's interesting? Remember in last Sunday's gospel, the, the demon said, what, are you here to pick a fight with me, Jesus? Are you going to destroy me, Jesus? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. And he said, be quiet. And he tells the demons to be quiet because he does not want evil lips to confess his holy name. But he wants us to confess his holy name in faith. That's what Jesus wants. And there he was in the synagogue, and there he was in Peter's house. And he's showing the kingdom of God bro broken through, and that he's the Messiah. And do they say, hallelujah, you are the Holy One, you are the Son of God come into this world? No. What do they do? They bring more sick people. There's no confession. Just bring more sick people. I mean, Paul had the same problem. I mean, read in 1 Corinthians. This, we were reading from 1 Corinthians this morning. At the very beginning, Paul talks about, you know, Greeks demand wisdom and Jews demand signs. So he would perform miracles because Jesus gave him the authority that when he was preaching, the kingdom of God was breaking in. And, and, and yet, what did these people, they just wanted more and more and more. They wanted more wisdom. They wanted more signs. They wanted more miracles. And Paul said, Paul says wisdom without the Holy Spirit just puffs you up. And miracles lead to an insatiable desire for more miracles. And you miss the forest for the
the trees. Jesus' miracles were for one purpose. And the miracles that the apostles, they performed, were for one purpose. To show the people that the kingdom of God had broken through and was right before them. couldn't see the forest for the trees, just like those people. All he could key in on was that he went before God. He made a promise, and all he could think about was the promise. So I said to him, Robert, you've got to stop thinking about worship the way that you're thinking about it. I mean, when Jesus, throughout the Gospels, when you look at Jesus, when he's confronted by legalists, because Robert had become a legalist, he had made a pro, uh, an offer, God accepted it, and so it was now that it was legally binding, and that's all that he thought about. And I said to him, let me tell you something about Jesus and about God. When Jesus was confronted by legalism, by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and, and the Essenes and all the others, and they would say, you know, what's really important, what's really important to God is that we obey rules and that they set up these rules. And you know what? We make up those same rules. You got to think about, and I got to think about the rules that I set up, that if I do this, God's going to bless me. Don't smoke, don't drink, don't, you know, all those things. God's going to bless me because I'm doing those things. I'm, I've made rules, and I'm sticking by the rules. And if I do that, God's going to bless me. Jesus would always say to them, unless you look at the law through eyes of faith, unless it is your most passionate desire to obey the rules because you love God, that your obedience is, is a consequence of a living faith in God, your obedience to rules are useless. You should read the prophet Amos. Amos was preaching to the northern tribes and was saying, you... He was pronouncing God's judgment. There was no turning back for them. It was all law. And God said through Amos, because they were going through the rituals, they were coming to church, they were coming to the synagogue, they were coming to the temple, they were offering their sacrifices, but there was nothing in their heart, there was nothing in their mind. There was no wanting to hear, to be in God's presence and to be obedient to him. And so God said, I despise your worship. I despise it. But let justice and righteousness flow like ever living streams from your worship. That will please me. So I said, Robert, you have to look at worship in a different way. I want you to understand something, and this is important for you to know. That you went before God with a humble and contrite heart. You, you humbled yourself. You knelt before God. You interceded for your mother. You said to God, Save and give life to the one who gave me life. 
save my mother. And God had mercy on you. He saved your mother. His hand, Christ's hand, oops, yeah, they did. It was it was like a bowl, right? But Christ's hand rebuked the disease that was in her and healed her. And by doing that, in response to your prayer, revealed His presence and His power to you in a way few people get to experience in their lives. God has reached out to you. God has touched you. God wants a relationship with you. God wants to guide you. God wants to love you. Yes, you have to go to church. desire to know more the one who saved your mom the one who wants to save you thanks mate I'll think about that Got up, and then you know the bus is moving, and this big guy back to his seat and sat down. And we never talked about it again. Paul, in his response, you know, like the res so you see healing miracles in and of themselves. Jesus, I mean, he looks at it, 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 he says, I want this to produce faith. I want it to produce confession. And Jesus said, we're going to move on because I have to preach. I have to preach. If you only experience the miracle and you don't hear me preach and you don't hear me who I am, if, you, if it's not revealed to you my, 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 my identity, my mission, my purpose, if you don't receive that, you're not, the kingdom of God will not break in. The kingdom of God will not break in. And that's why Paul said, they demand wisdom, they demand miracles, but I preach Christ crucified. Because when you feel, or you hear Christ crucified, you know, here's the thing. Robert and those people that brought the sick people to Jesus, they could see the sickness in the people they brought before the, thr the throne of God. Robert knew the sickness of his mother. The other people that in the gospel lesson, they, they knew that those they loved were sick and demon-possessed, and they brought them, but they did not see their own sickness. They didn't. And so when Jesus Christ crucified is preached, when we understand that he came to save us from our sin, and in the preaching of that gospel, the Holy Spirit reveals sin to us. And you know, when you think about it, when, when we think about Jesus hanging on the cross, you know, in my study, in my, well, it's my office at the house, my office, in front of my desk, I have a small painting, and it's just Jesus and it was done by this lovely lady, Mrs. Menchie. But it's, 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 it's the face of Jesus. It's the crown of thorns. It's the sweat. It's the blood. It's his face down. 
And I have that in front of my desk, so I always remember when I'm studying or I'm doing anything that the most important thing for me always to remember is Christ crucified. It's the only thing in front of me is Christ crucified. And that's so important to me. And it, it's, it's, it's who I have to proclaim because when we have Christ crucified, what is revealed to us is revealed to our sin. It's also, you know, the demons were obedient to Jesus. And, 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 you know, I'm thinking there are things, aren't there parts of our lives that no matter what we do, we can't change them? They're just, it just, we can't. And then, you know, you think of this prayer. Lord, grant me the serenity to know the things I can change and the things I can't and the wisdom to know the difference. But in a way, that's almost giving up. It's almost letting what holds you in bondage to keep holding you in bondage. And that's not what God wants. If demons are obedient to the word of uh, the, the, the voice of Jesus, what about those things? What about those demons that we all have? Can that same Jesus not drive them out of us? Must those things that hold us in, are, are they not just subject to Jesus? And subject to his authority and his power and the inbreaking of the kingdom of God? Yes, they are. And there can be delivery. Some of the things that we cannot change, God can. Jesus can. Jesus can have authority over any part of our lives that he wills and wishes. And so every time we're together in church, as the community of God, we have an opportunity to come before Jesus and say, you know that there's something that's vexing and harassing me, Jesus, and I beg you to drive it out. And it can happen. Because whenever we're together in Jesus' name, the kingdom of God is near us and it breaks out in a couple of minutes. Jesus is going to call us to the communion table. We believe, says in Matthew's Gospel 18:19. Where true or three are gathered together in my name, I am among you. That's why it's so important at the beginning when Rick says, we're making our beginning in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's so important because we're announcing to the world and saying to Jesus, saying to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we are gathering. And Jesus is present. And he's the one who gives you communion. He's the one who says, take and eat, this is my body. And I'm coming to you in a special way. I'm present in you. I'm coming to dwell with you. And then we receive the wine. And he says, take and drink, this is the cup. suffering, the cup of the new covenant of the forgiveness of your sins and he that blood of the covenant covers us and our sins are forgiven it's a miracle it's a miracle I told Robert 
God has touched you. You need to look at worship differently. Now, what are you going to do about that? Communion is real. Jesus is real. His forgiveness is real. His power is real. So what are you going to do about that? What am I going to do about that?